Hey buddy, if you don't know what you just clicked on, you are about to learn how much the CIA just absolutely sucks. It's a several part series, so you can start here if you want. If not, I got the first video linked in the description. Have fun, enjoy yourself, bust out the popcorn, and try not to get sent to a black site. Let's get into it, boys. Klaus Barbie. Klaus Barbie refers to the Barbie doll owned by the CIA's top secret science experiment gone wrong, the medical abomination that is a German skier's brain placed inside the body of a goldfish known simply as Klaus. <laughs> I'm doing too much coke! It may also refer to, although I find it very unlikely, Nazi war criminal, fugitive of France, and all around doo doo pants bad man, Nikolaus Klaus. Barbie. Known as the Butcher of Lyon for personally torturing Jews and members of the French resistance during World War II as head of the Gestapo in the French city of Lyon, Klaus Barbie has been estimated to be personally responsible for the deaths of over 14,000 people and was one of many quote unquote useful Nazis that the CIA recruited after the war. After Barbie's many atrocities during his time being you know, an actual straight up literal Nazi, he was hired by the United States Army's Counterintelligence Corps in 1947. So why exactly would the US want an actual high-ranking Nazi dubbed the Butcher of Lyon for his well-known personal torture of innocents on its payroll? Well, because he could help them shit on the heads of communists, of course. Why else? You know, why else did they do literally anything? They specifically scooped up this particular war criminal because they wanted him to tell them about British interrogation techniques that he had experienced firsthand. I don't know why they couldn't have just asked, you know, the British themselves about it instead of hiring an actual Nazi, but it may be because British people aren't real, as we all know very well. And if you want to share that fact, take a visit to necessarydrip.com, link in the description. Anyway, Nazi Barbie. Wow. Didn't put that together till now. This guy was literally a Nazi Barbie. Uh, I guess Ken's about as Aryan as you can get, so I guess that tracks. In addition to the British interrogation techniques that, for some reason, we couldn't just wake Churchill up from his cigar-induced stroke coma by poking him with a stick and waving a teabag under his nose to get. At any rate, that is what we're going to try to do. The U.S. also hired Barbie to see if he knew the locations and identities of other former Nazis so they could dole out the justice that they deserved for ending the lives of millions of innocents. I'm just kidding, of course, that would be a moral decision. And that's, that's very unlike the CIA to make. It was so they could hire them too. Specifically to see if there was any that the British intelligence service might want to recruit for their own, presumably more crumpet-based, useful Nazi purposes. Which makes the whole British interrogation techniques thing even more strange to me if they're already in direct contact with the British for Klaus to tell them if there's any other not I I don't know it, history is weird now the French as you can imagine were not huge fans of the old barbster on account of him committing war crimes on them and such so shortly after the war they sentenced him to death in absentia meaning that he's not actually physically there for them to execute him but whenever they do get their little French mitts on him death time murder moment, kill a clock, you know, which they would presumably carry out via guillotine. Uh, the French fucking loved that thing, dude. It's not just a stereotype. You know, the last time that somebody was officially executed via guillotine was in France in 1977. The guy that got chopped was kind of a total piece of shit waste of a human body, but that's still pretty kooky, isn't it? 1977, that is, that's recent. Anyway, after the French sentenced Barbie to death, they learned that he was working for the US and promptly shrieked with glee like a 12 year old with a broccoli haircut getting Mr. Beast merch for Kwanzaa at the thought that they would actually get to carry out this death sentence on this brutal war criminal. They presumably started aggressively polishing that guillotine in anticipation. I mean, they, they were stoked as hell. So the French government went to the US High Commissioner for Germany, John J. McCloy, and were like, oh, 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 enchanté. Don't worry, I won't keep doing that. Is Ashante even a French thing? Ooh la la. They were like, hey Pally, hey friend, listen, a little Barbie, I mean Birdie, told me that you hired a special little Nazi we've been looking for. War criminal and all, you know the guy. Anyway, we kind of sentenced him to death on account of, you know, those war crimes he did on us and all. So if you could just go ahead and hand him over in accordance with international law, that would be sweet. McCloy allegedly either outright refused the request or just straight up left the French on red. And instead of returning this Nazi war criminal to face his rightful justice in France, again, in accordance with international law, the US decided to, well, 
not do that. The opposite of that. They decided to do the exact opposite of that. Instead, they helped this absolute monster escape to Bolivia to very illegally evade his punishment through a series of what were referred to as rat lines, a system of escape routes set up by the US intelligence services and the Roman Catholic clergy for some reason, to help former Nazis and other fascists escape to other countries, primarily in South America, to evade punishment for, you know, being Nazis and whatnot. Yeah, you thought that this guy was the only piece of shit fascist that the US helped escape punishment after World War II? Nah, dog. Nah, they had a whole f***ing system of escape routes set up. Helping these monsters escape their rightful comeuppets was a full-time operation. In his book, The Nazis Next Door, investigative reporter Eric Lichtblau claims that the US government allowed not tens, not dozens, not even hundreds, but thousands of former Nazis to settle within the United States in exchange for them helping them in the fight against communism post-World War II. Klaus Barbie was just a particular egregious needle in a massive f***ed up Nazi haystack. Or I guess that would make him a needle in a needle stack, but that, you, that shut up. When Barbie arrived in Bolivia, he decided it was time for a rebrand, changing his name to Klaus Altman and living out the rest of his life peacefully attempting to atone for his misdeeds by actively volunteering in the community and generously donating to charity. Except that is a lie, he continued to be just just the worst. Just a real unchill fella. Barbie, now calling himself Altman, formed close relationships to multiple Bolivian dictators, including Hugo Basner, Luis Garcia Mesa, and our old friend and known chubby chaser, Rene Barrientos, who we discussed in Tier 3. You remember him? You retaining any of this information, or are you literally asleep right now because you use these videos to go to bed? Derek, I know I am. No, but seriously, do leave the entire series on while you sleep. Do it like three times, actually. Re really let the information sink in there. So, yeah, Barbie became good butt buddies with the Bolivian dictators, assisting them in suppressing the opposition, and even teaching them, quote, how torture can best be used. I guess the Bolivians were just using torture to, like, fill the potholes and open their Pringles cans, and then this guy comes along and is like, nah, 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 or... I guess. 999. Nine, 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 nine. You guys are doing it all wrong. You gotta use torture to build showers and acquire skinny mustaches. And, and these guys aren't even Jews. What the f are you guys doing? Is this fucking amateur hour over here? Is it bring your fucking kid to school and let him run the country day around this place? Get your shit together. But, you know. In Spanish. No, 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 ustedes. Lo están haciendo todo mal. Tienen que usar la tortura para construir... He was talking to Bolivian dictators, after all. After hiring a bodyguard with some particularly shady connections named Alvaro de Castro, and with some help from an unnamed Austrian company, my money's on Red Bull. Red Bull gives you wings. Barbie soon found himself selling weapons to the South American drug cartels and even arranged the security of the Colombian cartel's entire raw coca supply directly through Pablo Escobar himself. This guy really knows how to pick them, huh? Like, when you've worked with the biggest drug lord in history, numerous brutal South American dictators, and, you know, Hitler? That may be indicative of a pattern of behavior there, pal. You may want to seek some psychiatric assistance. I mean, he was really getting his stereotypical bad guy punch card filled out here. In exchange for this, the notoriously kind and charitable Mr. Escobar agreed to fund Barbie's, quote, anti-communist activities, including his involvement in the assassination of Che Guevara. Then, as a little cherry on top, Barbie worked with a group known as the Fiancés of Death, a network of former Nazis and fascists, and coordinated a, quote, large purchase of tanks from Austria, Red Bull, which they then used to carry out an entire goddamn coup. This guy really is a go-getter. I'll give him that. The, 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 guy, the guy really needs to hang up his hat. He needs to retire from living. In 1972, when Barbie was nearly 60 years old and had been on the run for about 21 years at this point, he was still up to his old tricks providing security for the military junta in Peru when two Nazi hunters by the name of Sergei and Bette Klarsfeld uncovered a secret document that revealed that Klaus Altman, his fake name, was actually Klaus Barbie. They then brought in a French journalist to interview Barbie, a request that for some ungodly reason, he accepted. I don't know exactly what the logic was there. I guess to 
prove that he is not, in fact, an escaped Nazi war criminal hiding in South America. But if that was the point, um, he didn't exactly hit the mark with that one. You see, Barbie, after changing his identity to Klaus Altman, claimed he only knew Spanish, and the journalist interviewing quote unquote Altman at some point went off script from the questions that they had agreed on before the interview. I think what this guy is telling me is that I should go kill myself and I, you know, I don't like that. Asking Altman in French, a language he supposedly does not know how to speak, if he had ever been to Lyon, a city he's obviously been to before since he's named for, you know, butchering in it, to which Klaus immediately denied in German. No, 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 no. Oof. That is a that's a bad look, buddy. That's not that's not looking too good for you. Bro, the over, shut shut it off. Off. After his discovery, Klaus then, despite massive public outcry, You can't keep getting away with it. He can't keep getting away with it! Was allowed to return to Bolivia, who refused to extradite him back to France under the claim that Bolivia and France did not have an extradition treaty and that, get this, the quote, statute of limitations on Barbie's crimes had passed. Now, I don't know about you, okay, everybody's different, but personally, uh, I don't really think that the statute of limitations applies to you know, literal Nazi war crimes. I don't really think that that is in the, uh, the spirit of law. I don't even think that there's a statute of limitations on regular murder, let alone some shit that gets you nicknamed the Butcher of Leon. Eventually, the sympathetic dictator of Bolivia was replaced with a less Nazi-supporting democratic government in 1983, and Klaus was finally extradited back to France, where, in the end, his head did not, in fact, actually roll, uh, as France had abolished the death penalty two years prior. God, that is some bad timing, isn't it? That is some, oof. Bet you wish you hadn't done that, huh? They should make some exceptions to that sometimes. I think they could slip at least one guy in, you know? Because personally, I don't really believe in the death penalty, especially here in America. The justice system is fucked. It does not work. And innocent people get sent to jail and convicted, and it's worth letting a couple of guilty people rot in jail forever than, than killing any innocent man. But this is, the guy is, I, he's a proven Nazi. It's, it, he's, the guy's guilty, you know? Like if, it's a tough one. He's a, he's a Nazi. And that's just like a regular one. He was the butcher of Leon. Come on now. You don't get a nickname like the Butcher of Leon because you're just following orders. You put in the initiative, buddy. Klaus was instead sentenced to life in prison after leading a relatively good life uh, full of dictator slash drug lord aiding in South America for 33 years after his escape from Germany. He ended up dying four years later when he got three separate cancers all at the same time. <laughs> and you know, I assumed he would have just uh, gotten murdered as soon as he got into prison for being a literal Nazi. Uh, but then I remembered that prison is actually probably the best place to be a Nazi. So, you know, he's probably doing all right. Disregarding the three separate cancers. I imagine that wasn't incredibly comfortable. Can you imagine all the skinheads in there when they sent them a real legitimate proven seal of approval non-figurative Nazi? He must have been going bananas. During all of this, it became public knowledge that the United States had actively hired this Nazi and then actively and, again, very illegally aided his escape from French justice to South America, about which the U.S. then formally told France, Oopsie Daisy, uh, RB, dog, won't happen again, bruh. Uh, well, maybe only like two or three more times, but that is it. That is it, on God. But again, I, I think this entry is just about a German fish's doll, so I, I don't know why I went on about this guy for so long. The Argentine Dirty War and 1976 coup. The Argentine Dirty War refers to a politically motivated genocide against leftists. Wait, didn't we, didn't we cover this one already? Wait, no, that was Indonesia. They did it again? They did it again. You can't keep getting away with it! This additional communist genocide was carried out in Argentina from 1974 until 1983 by the country's military junta and South American death squads, and was aided by the United States, the CIA, and worst of all, by the literally hundred year old human tortoise that just refuses to die despite popular vote, Henry Kissinger. Two communist genocides in the same tier, huh? Wow, 
uh, what? The, the CIA must just be loving this one. All right, so in 1974, the then president of Argentina, Juan Perón, engaged in an activity that some doctors have told me is not very good for your health, uh, dying, after which his wife, Isabel, took over power of the country. He died is what I'm saying. I don't know if that information got through the shitty joke there. Why don't I just take it out then, you ask? Take the terrible joke out, you say? I can't. I physically can't do it. I, I, people in the comments are like, ooh, cool info, very interesting stuff. I just wish he didn't make a Family Guy tear joke every 30 seconds. I had to gouge my eyes out and then drink bleach. I had to break into my emergency bleach drinking cabinet, get out my bleach cups, and then drink bleach because he, he keeps making these jokes. I need to put bleach in my butt before I can go to sleep or else all the bugs are gonna find my man mud and make a home in it. Guys, I can't stop. It, it's like, I can't do it. It's like I have some kind of disability. I'm doing it right now. I, I'm literally doing it currently. Who asked for this? Aren't I supposed to be talking about Argentina or some shit? This is writ literally written in the script. I'm just reading off of it. This whole tangent, it's written down. I wrote down the fact that it's written in the script. I wrote this down, this thing I'm saying right now. Do you know how long these videos would be without all the quote unquote jokes? It'd be like five minutes long. A solid four and a half minutes of unsighted CIA information and then 30 seconds for patron shout outs. I I've done the math. So that guy that died, uh, that Juan Perón fella, he was president of Argentina from 1946 to 1955, and boy howdy did people like him. Oh, oh me oh my. He was a popular fella, sticking his tongue out for the picture. Following the creatively titled political ideology of Peronism, Peron instituted several social programs to aid the poor and working class, supported labor unions, and publicly called for the state to play a larger role in the nation's economy. <laughs> Commie, commi, communist. Commie, commi. Yeah, I was thinking it was gonna go that way too. A uh, guy starts acting a little fruity in the socialist department, CIA picks up the scent trail, and boom, another Ooh. Juan bites the dust. Because his name is Juan. It's like the best joke I've ever made in my entire life. My whole career, I can end it here. But no, actually, Argentina, I believe because it hates me and wants to see me dead, made it much more complicated than that. So complicated, in fact, that I am literally not even gonna get into it, because frankly, it's not important, I barely understand it myself, and I am not spending another week writing a confusing ass 20 minute long entry like that Indonesian genocide one, okay? I won't do it. I refuse, I firmly refuse. Juan was overthrown during a coup in 1955 that had something to do with the economy taking a shit and Juan pissing off a whole bunch of Christians who then got the army involved. Don't ask me how, the army loved Jesus, I guess. And then the military conspired with both the Socialist Party of Argentina and various conservative groups in the country. It was a mess. Uh, but really all that matters is they kicked him out, okay. The military exiled Perón from the country, and Argentina's new dictator, Pedro Eugenio Aramburu, even made the use of Perón's name illegal. Couldn't say the guy's name, couldn't bring him up, it's jail for you. This systematic Perón hating at every level of governance continued for roughly 18 years, old enough to uh, go fight and die in a war, but not quite old enough to drink the silly juice. And because Perón was loved by leftists for his social programs and whatnot, they started to get pretty ticked off by this. It's actually a bit more complicated than that because of course it is. Argentina wants me dead. Remember? Uh, Juan was more of a populist than anything else, left or right politically, and he did have a lot of what could be called fascisty tendencies. A lot of people likened him to the Nazis, and like many other places in South America, as we just discussed, he even allowed a lot of former Nazis to take refuge in Argentina after the war. And there's even a pretty cuckoo nuts banana balls theory that H.I. double Hitler sticks actually fled and took refuge in Argentina for the rest of his life, as opposed to renovating his head to be more open concept. So basically a lot of people on the right liked him too, but let's not even talk about that, okay? I'm gonna have a goddamn aneurysm over here and I cannot afford the medical bills. So leftists started getting rowdy on account of all the repression and Perón hating by Argentina's new regime and some left-wing guerrilla forces even started popping up and wilding out as left-wing guerrillas are want to do. These groups were small, easily defeated by the Argentine government and did not have a ton of public support, which is important to mention because it ties into why this event I'm about to describe was referred to as the 
Dirty War. As I mentioned, the Dirty War was a politically motivated genocide against leftists that was partially spurred on by the emergence of these left-wing guerrillas, but as we will soon discuss, went far past just these small militant groups that they easily snuffed out. And the Argentinian military actually coined the term Dirty War themselves, which I, you know, I wouldn't expect that. It's not, it does, it's not exactly a term that makes you sound good. You know, I, if you're gonna coin a term, you'd think they would pick like the non-dirty war, the totally clean, we did nothing wrong and all have giant wieners war, you know? But dirty war does sound quite a bit better than brutal genocide. So, you know, I guess I see the motivation there a little bit. They called it a dirty war to imply that it was you know, a war, a kind of civil war between uh, the military and these leftists, as opposed to what it really was, which was closer to a one-sided massacre. Because, you know, if you call it a war, it sounds like there's two sides involved, you know? It, who's at fault there? Who's the bad guy? They're both just warring, you know, no harm, no foul. They did call it a dirty war, though, because even they could not justify not adding a little something to differentiate the brutal nonsense they got up to from an actual legitimate war. But this was not a war, dirty or otherwise. It was dirty, but not a war for many reasons. One, these leftist guerrillas themselves were not even close to a force that could reasonably rival the entire Argentine military. Okay, that, that, that'd be like putting Mike Tyson in the ring with a paraplegic sea otter and calling it a fair fight. Okay, that's just not how it works. During the trial for the military junta responsible for this dirty quote unquote war in 1985, the prosecution established, quote, the guerrillas were never strong enough to pose a real threat to the state and could not be considered a belligerent as in a war. And they said about the situation, the guerrillas had not taken control of any part of the national territory, they had not obtained recognition of interior or anterior belligerency, they were not massively supported by any foreign power, and they lacked the population's support. And two, the Argentine military may have claimed that its primary objective here was to eradicate these dangerous left-wing guerrilla forces that posed a threat to the state, but if that was really the case, you would think that the majority of the people that they killed would be, you know, left-wing guerrillas, which was simply not the case. Simply, simply not to the case. Half of the total victims of this dirty quote unquote war were just non-militant trade unionists. And many others were simply high school and college students, various intellectuals, including journalists and writers, civil rights activists, and various other civilians and their families. Emphasis on their families there as well. We'll get to that. I just wanted to get out of the way that despite the name, not a war, okay? Dirty massacre is what it was. So, to recap, president gets exiled, 18 years of Perón hating, the dictator made it illegal to use his name, all that jazz, until in 1973, he just came back and became president again. I know, big plot twist there. I guess there was a public outcry for a return to democratic voting, but like I said, the guy died like a year later and everything just went right back to shit anyway. So, before Perón's wife Isabel had even taken over power in the country after Juan's death, Argentina's Minister of Social Welfare, Jose Lopez Riga, had already created a far-right death squad in the country known as the Argentine anti Communist Alliance, or more commonly called AAA. Do not get these guys confused when you break down on the side of the road, okay? If you do accidentally call them in for a tow, just pray you're not driving a Prius, all right? They'll be able to tell that you voted for Obama within seconds. Isabel and her later replacement, Italo Luder, then signed four decrees into law empowering the military and police to, quote, annihilate subversive left-wing elements. Then, in 1976, Isabel was overthrown during a coup that was part of the CIA's Operation Condor, the series of South American shenanigans we discussed back in Tier 3. After this coup, Argentina was controlled by a U.S. and CIA-backed military junta, which we funded through $50 million in military aid. The military junta then embarked on what they called the National Reorganization process or dirty war. Now, the national reorganization process 
That is exactly what I would think that they would call something like the Dirty War. That is right on the nose. That is a, that is like a health alteration committee tier term right there. No, no, we're not committing a brutal genocide. We're just doing a little national reorganizing, you know, just tidying up a bit, getting a little spring cleaning done. It was getting really dirty around here and we had to go, you know, to war. With the dirt, it was a dirty war, let me tell you what. This national reorganization process then led to the arrest, torture, killings, or forced disappearance of up to 30,000 people. And the disappearance part is a key thing here, as the majority of the victims seem to simply up and vanish, and were known as the desaper uh, desaparecidos. Desaparecidos, or the disappeared. And for their families, whether their disappeared loved one was one of the countless dead or one of the 12,000 alive and imprisoned, being tortured in one of Argentina's 340 secret concentration camps, or who knows, maybe even free and on the run or in hiding somewhere, they just didn't know. They had no way of knowing, and that's something that they just had to sit and wonder about for years with absolutely no closure. Heavy shit. And similar to your mother, it just keeps getting heavier. In 1977, a group of mothers whose children had been taken and become part of the disappeared started demonstrating every Thursday in front of the Casa Rosada in Buenos Aires, the capital of Argentina. And what is the Casa Rosada, you may ask? Well, you know how we have a White House? Well, if you know Spanish, you'd know that Casa Rosada means pork house. Wait, pink house means pink house. They have a pink house over there. It's not white, it's pink. Ha ha, very funny, right? Wrong! These very sad protesting moms were known as the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo and were protesting to demand the junta tell them where their kids are. In December of that year, several members of the Madres as well as two nuns disappeared themselves and were later found dead, their bodies having washed up on beaches south of the capital. They had been victims of so-called death flights, which along with massive firing squads, were one of the junta's primary methods for disposing of the disappeared. These death flights were basically that scene in Scarface where they throw the dude out of the helicopter, but on a massive, systematic scale, with thousands of people being flown up into the air over the ocean and thrown out to their deaths into the water, never to be seen again, unless their bodies washed up on the beach or something like these moms and nuns. Moms and nuns, people, listen to this shit. We gave them $50 million. They were taking people's kids and then throwing their own mothers out of planes into the ocean to their deaths. And in response, we gave them $50 million. I want $50 million. Is this the type of shit you gotta do to get $50 million nowadays? Because frankly, I don't think I'd do it. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's quite worth it. Maybe Elon and Bezos aren't above hucking moms out of planes, but I like to think I have slightly more integrity than that. The CIA clearly did not. However, $50 million. In addition to AAA, the far-right death squads, the dictatorship, and military junta, Argentina also had its own CIA of sorts, known as the Secretariat of Intelligence, S-I-D-E, or SIDE. And these guys were dark, okay? They were super dark. I mean, you could say, one might even say, it could be said that they could say that they were the dark side. These guys took care of the more high-level special operations type shit involved in the national reorganization process, such as assassinating several high-profile targets, including a Chilean general, two former Uruguayan MPs, and even the ex-president of Bolivia. They even assisted the Bolivian general, Luis Garcia Mesa Dru... God damn it, why does he have so many names? Luis Garcia Meza Tejada in something called the Cocaine Coup in Bolivia with the help of two fellows you should find strangely familiar from two entries earlier in this tier, a high-ranking member of Italian Gladio named Stefano Dele Gar God damn it. Stefano Dele Chiai. God damn. Along with, can you guess? I, I want you to guess. I'm not gonna get the gong because for once it's not the CIA. F Klaus Barbie. They got the goddamn Butcher of Leon in on this shit, bro. It's all connected, I swear. Air America is going to do a flyby over Argentina or some shit. It is somewhat fitting that this Nazi war criminal was involved, given that an Argentinian naval captain involved in the Dirty War publicly stated that the Argentine military did, quote, worse things than the Nazis. And this guy, out of anybody, would know, as he was tried for 30 counts of murder, 96 
of causing injury, 255 of terror, 286 counts of torture, and was also literally charged with genocide. That is, he was five stars in GTA for sure. And his name? Adolfo Silingo. Adolfo. Come on, guys, that is just lazy writing. The guy flees to a Spanish-speaking country, just throws an O at the end of his name. Come on, guys, get creative. So, now that you know just how f***ed up all this shit was, let's talk about a man somehow even more grotesque, Henry Kissinger. So, even though at least six American citizens had been disappeared by the Argentine junta by 1976, Secretary of State at the time, Mr. Kissassinger himself, was the man who secretly, quote, gave the junta the green light with their murderous, genocidal activities. In 1976, Kissinger even specifically told the junta to, quote, hurry up and finish before Congress gets back in session and pulls military aid. Real good guy, real morally upstanding fellow that Kissinger is. 100 years old, you know. He is. He's a centurion, or whatever they're called. Centurion? He's f***ing old. It's gonna be him and Keith Richards till the end of time, I swear. Be kind and take care of the planet, guys. I mean, think of the world we're gonna leave for Henry Kissinger. Propaganda due. Propaganda due, or Propaganda 2, when translated from Pasta Talk, was an Italian branch of the Freemasons founded in 1877, which transformed into a secret, illegal, leftist-hating, radical, right-wing criminal organization. It's actually what The Godfather Part 3 is based on, if you can believe it. I've never seen it personally, because my mom doesn't let me watch watch horror movies, but that's what the internet tells me. Dantavius, specifically. And if this sounds kind of like the plot to The Godfather Part 3, that's because it is. The movie's actually based on these events. I love you, Uncle Dan. Hit me up. Keep hating Franklin for me. Propaganda Due was also known as P2 for short, and that's how it will mostly be referred to from here on out by me, because again, lazy. P2 was sometimes referred to as a state within a state, a deep state, or a shadow government because of just how much goddamn pizza power they held over Italy. I mean, there wasn't a salami getting sliced or a meatball getting subbed south of Switzerland without their say-so. Nearly 1,000 of Italy's elite, including three cabinet members, were allegedly members of an outlawed, super-secret, super-evil Masonic lodge called Propaganda Due or P2. An illegal, ultra-secret political society of Italian Freemasons. In the 1970s, he inducted almost a thousand of Italy's most powerful men in clandestine rituals here in Rome's Excessior Hotel. The Lodge counted many Italian VIPs within its ranks, ranging from prominent journalists and industrialists to military leaders, members of parliament, some dude named Silvio Berlusconi, who later became the prime minister of the entire damn boot-shaped country, and even each of the heads of all three Italian intelligence agencies at the time. Sisti, Sismi, and Cesis. Sismi with that bullshit, you know. You better cease this, your investigations. I love you, Eric. Hit me up. No, come here. Give Hillary a kiss. Come on, give mommy a kiss. Uh, am I gonna do it? Mm, am I gonna do it? Oh, no, I'm not gonna do it. Oh, but I, I pissed myself. What if instead of a fine wine, I told you to drink fucking bleach? Bobulus! Everybody! For context, that's like if the head of the CIA, FBI, and NSA were all in the same secret, illegal, radical right-wing underground Masonic lodge together at the same time. Hail, brothers! Kuranan Silleria Uzumahok. Except with more marinara sauce. And presumably those long white hats for which the chefs wear and whatnot. You know, the, the Chef Boyardee's nuts hat. The one that Remy skull f***s Luigi under in Ratatouille. Wait, no, his name wasn't Luigi. Sorry for being racist. I'm sure it was something far less stereotypical. Good lord, it's Linguini. That's a pasta. Mamma mia. What are haircuts like for that guy, by the way? I mean, even if it doesn't physically hurt him, he's still got to be having a f***ing seizure in the chair every time the guy pulls his hair back to snip. And how did he not realize that he could be f***ing marionetted by just pulling on his hair for his entire life up until that rat tugged on him? Had you just never had somebody touch your head before? Are you that Discord dependent? Touch grass, Linguini. What if he puts his shit up in like a ponytail or a man bun or something? Is he just immediately stuck in like a rigor mortis-esque hogtie position until somebody finds him and frees his follicles? I got problems. I got problems with the plot of a 
20-year-old children's movie. Uh, what in the good Christian f*** were we talking about? Propaganda do I? In addition to their very big-dicked influential Italian members, P2 also had sway in countries like Venezuela, Brazil, Uruguay, Chile, and our old friends from the last entry, Argentina, including the guy who created the AAA death squads, Juan Perón himself, and some members of the military junta. So, you know, these guys were big, okay? Very influential. They're going international here. All while, again, being a secret, illegal, leftist-hating, radical right-wing Masonic lodge. I mean, they were basically the mini Illuminati. A uh, small Illuminati, if you will. Although I'd like to save the phrase small Illuminati for a, like a secret gathering of midgets. So let's go with like Italian Illuminati, the Italian Illuminati. So at this point, you might be wondering, what? is this thing though really and so was i i was terrified there was too much information and i was shitting in my pants but that was the past okay those pants are at the cleaners and i'm ready to tell you but first we got to talk about p2's founder lucio jelly lucio jelly girl when jelly was 17 sometime in the 1930s he somehow was expelled from all the schools in italy all of them not a one nobody was teaching this schmuck i don't know why or how this occurred, a nationwide expulsion, but I'm going to assume it must have been a truly epic senior prank, like he gave the principal herpes or something. Just a real good one. Jelly then volunteered to fight for Italian fascism in Spain, becoming one of Mussolini's black shirts before becoming a liaison between fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. Now, this is a spoiler here, okay? So if you haven't seen World War II, go ahead and skip forward 10 seconds, but the fascists they actually lost, believe it or not. I know, right? They were so fashionable, those fascists. But either way, after they lost, Jelly was forced to flee to Argentina to escape punishment for some teeny weeny little war crimes he committed, uh, kind of like the Italian version of Klaus Barbie. This is where he met our old friend Juan Perón and actually convinced him to join the Freemasons himself, and also probably where he rounded up the rest of those previously mentioned terrible Argentinian scum that he would later induct into P2. After going from black shirt fascist to wanted war criminal to Argentinian fugitive, Jelly then moved into the much more interesting and exciting career field of mattress sales before founding his own textile company and raking in the big bucks. He then went on to become tied to the Masons in Italy and eventually found his own Masonic lodge, Propaganda Due, in 1966. The lodge technically already existed, but he kind of reinvented it reinvigorated, revamped it, uh, gave it a facelift, a second wind, if you will, woke it up with a surprise early morning rim job. Uh, we call that a Thailand alarm clock in the business. Jelly's villainous master plot, which he aimed to accomplish through this lodge, was to form a new political and economic elite in the country in order to lead Italy away from what he saw as the biggest danger to life, liberty, and cannoli as we know it, communism. The Lodge sought to do this by instituting a form of authoritarian democracy through some aggressive Italian-style bribery and political corruption. To quote a secret document titled Plan of Democratic Rebirth that was found in the false bottom of a suitcase which belonged to Jelly's daughter and is considered to be kind of P2's political manifesto of sorts, political parties, newspapers, and trade unions can be the objects of possible solicitations which could take the form of economic financial maneuvers. The availability of sums not exceeding 30 to 40 billion lire would seem sufficient to allow carefully chosen men acting in good faith to conquer key positions necessary for overall control. So basically, they were trying to pay off the entire goddamn country of Italy, which Understandable. I mean, who hasn't tried to bribe the entire country of Italy at some point? It's pretty standard stuff. But sometimes, rarely, it doesn't exactly, you know, work. Uh, and that's when you have to step it up a notch and maybe, just possibly, maybe, call up the CIA and mention that you hate communism. That has been proven to be a very effective strategy to accomplish most tasks that don't involve morals, ethics, or a sensible budget. Because who needs those? Really, morals and ethics don't kill communists, and neither do guns, actually. People kill communists with guns, supplied by the CIA. So P2 decided to do a coup to help some schlemuel, known as Junio Borghese, whack and replace the Italian president, 
which then failed miserably. And this sounds like the CIA, right? The CIA did that, right? A failed coup to help an illegal clandestine cabal of far-right elites overthrow a democratically elected government. That's the CIA, right? That, that the CIA did that. The CIA couldn't have not done that. Well, actually, mind-bogglingly, yes. Yes, they were involved. How? What gave it away? I started writing that part when I thought that they actually were not involved, but then I was like, no, seriously, this isn't your boy's first trip to the black side, okay? I've been around the blood-soaked block a few times at this point. There is literally no way <laughs> that the agency wasn't at least a little involved in this. So I decided to double up the Adderall and dig even more aggressively into it. And I was right. Look at me go. It's the power of pharmaceuticals. An investigation launched after P2's discovery, more than a decade later, uncovered that the U.S. Embassy's military attaché was closely connected with the coup organizers, and that good old not a crook Ricky Nixon was not only aware of, but closely followed the preparations for the coup, the details of which he was personally informed of by two CIA officers. And this obviously means that the CIA knew about it to tell the president about it. That's just math. You can do math. Transitive property. And all of this was confirmed by a Freedom of Information Act request in 2004 by the Italian newspaper La Repubblica, by the way. You want me to actually cite my sources for once. I really doubled, I really doubled up on the Adderall. In addition to a straight up coup attempt on the highest levels of government in a major Western European country, which Apparently, the guy who was in charge of called off the night it was supposed to go down after everyone was in position, ready to go, because it was raining, by the way. Uh, he hadn't worked in a little sky moisture into the backup plan at all, apparently. The plot was very dependent on consistent, reliable dryness, I guess. Which, I mean, I guess if there was like a supposed to be like a fire or a bombing or something involved, that does make sense, because it would just... You know. In addition to that unexpectedly wet coup shit show, Propaganda Due was also involved in taking over numerous media outlets, a bombing called the Bologna Massacre in 1980, and the very suspicious death of the head of one of Italy's major banks, just to name some of the nonsense they got up to in their attempt to shit on the heads of communists. It was all pretty shady underground stuff, and it was all going down during the years of lead, which, if you remember from the Operation Gladio entry earlier, was also heavily blamed on them as well, a CIA operation. So there is heavy speculation that the CIA was involved in more than just the failed coup attempt when it comes to P2 through Operation Gladio, although that has not been directly proven, I think pretty sure. I don't know. I honestly think I got like psychosis or something during this part of the script because I literally do not remember writing any of this shit. Olaf Palme assassination. Wait, they whacked Olaf? Uh, that annoying little snow douche from Frozen? Can't have shit around the CIA, can you? Are you? What was he, distributing the snow and ice too equally? What did Olaf do to deserve this? Oh, I don't know why, but I've always loved the idea of and Oh, wait, no, no, not the snow person. Uh, he was he was the prime minister of Sweden. What's the difference though, really? Also, this is a neon green one again. I feel like I may have stopped mentioning that at some point. So not proven, just a theory. Okay, a CIA-based conspiracy theory. Okay. All right. On February 28th, 1986, the Prime Minister of Sweden, Olaf Palme, was shot and killed while leaving a cinema, Batman style. Fortunately, there was no child present to be orphaned into turning into a bad fearing yet paradoxically bad fetishing Dark Knight with a taste for vengeance and butt cheeks for days. But still, Batman, right? That's the plot of Batman. I think Batman's parents were leaving the opera, not the cinema, possibly, but that, that's not relevant. Also, can you imagine being so rich that your butler just becomes your dad after he dies? How did that work? Batman nerds, please enlighten me in the comments. I'm shining my bat nerd signal for you here in my time of great need. You can also think of it as the Swedish version of the JFK incident, if you prefer a non-DC Comics-based analogy, a terribly investigated assassination of the leader of a first world country that a shit ton of people think the CIA were behind. There's some parallels there, for sure. I mean, those don't just happen every day. It's at most like a bi-monthly occurrence. Now, this Olaf character, 
similar to the snowman, actually, was quite a divisive fella, with no shortage of enemies or people who might want him dead. He was equally as popular as he was hated, and held a firm stance on a lot of controversial issues, some of which we'll talk about later when we get into possible CIA involvement. Because his murder is still technically unsolved, the laundry list of his haters being longer than a Texas prison sentence for being caught with a half ounce of the giggle bush, I just want to say that I consider you both very guilty. Oh, great adventure, buddy. Rick and Morty go to Texas prison. You know, if somebody drops the Yee. it'll be really easy to pause oh. after that. And the absolute piss fire that was the police investigation into the assassination, there have been many conspiracies and many possible suspects put forward throughout the years. The police really did do a terrible job investigating it. They were too busy eating donuts or whatever the Swedish cop equivalent of that is, pickled herrings or some shit, to actually solve the assassination of the leader of their entire goddamn country. You'd think that would be like, you know, the most important dude to investigate the murder of, you know? At least with the JFK situation, they still blamed someone for it. I mean, they literally did not even say who they think killed this guy until 34 years later in 2020, okay? Uh, but we'll get to that later too. Uh, sit tight, pal, okay? Tighten your ass up to that seat. Glue your ass to that seat, damn it. Don't leave me. First my wife and kids, then my therapist. I can't have you bang my dad and fly off to Aruba too, okay? I'm at my limit here. Now, before we get into the long lengthy list of suspects. I will sprinkle in a little bit of context here for flavor. Olaf was shot a few blocks away after leaving the cinema in the back from point blank range. Here's an artist rendition of it. Ooh, so pretty. How nice. What is that, oil base? Better keep the CIA away from it. And the killer then took off on foot down a street with an incredibly Swedish name and ran up a shit ton of stairs. Here's a picture of them too. Ooh, how pretty. So nice. What is that, concrete base? Better keep the CIA away from it. And he was never seen again. So. We at least know that the killer had some jacked ass quads and hammies, that is for sure. Despite being the biggest dick in the land, so to speak, uh, prime minister and all, Olaf apparently made a point of trying to live as close to a normal life as possible. And to that aim, it was a well-known fact that he often chose to forego bodyguards when he went out and about to get jiggy on the town normal style. I personally see this more as making a point to not live uh, at all. Uh, but hey, hindsight is 360 no scope or whatever the expression is. This fact could have easily been taken advantage of with some prior knowledge and planning. However, Olaf's decision to go to the movies that night was not public knowledge, and in fact was kind of a last minute decision for everyone involved. Olaf himself, his wife, his son, and his girlfriend had only decided to go a few hours before they actually went, and the police even searched the Palme residence for traces of wiretaps to see if anyone could have been listening in on them and found nothing, so it would have been impossible for anyone to really know that he was going to be there before he was. Unless, of course, they had like a tail on him at his house or something, or like a tracker, or really any number of other things that are totally within the realm of possibility for a major assassination of a prime minister, so I don't really know why I'm bringing this up uh, at all. So there's your flavor. All right, let's go ahead and get on with it. It's time for the suspects, South Africa. So a week before Palme was shot, he gave a speech at the Swedish People's Parliament against apartheid in Stockholm, which shockingly uh, was not very pro-apartheid. And apartheid, if you don't know, was basically just South Africa saying it's okay to be racist, uh, but like hardcore mode. Jim Crow on steroids, basically, it was bad stuff. He was right to be against it. And as part of this speech, he said, quote, apartheid cannot be reformed. It has to be abolished. Now, the South African government at the time was kind of digging its apartheid. Uh, they didn't really want to abolish or reform it, for that matter. But is this theory really saying that they would go through the trouble of murdering a major international figure just because of one comment he made at a singular keynote speech? Yes, Bofors and the Indian Connection. So this whole angle involves something known as the Bofors Scandal, which, of course, is back when India requested arms from Sweden, to which Olaf replied that they could suck on Bofors D's nuts and then default danced on the podium. Historians believe that Palme was attempting to say Bofa D's nuts, as the phrase is typically uttered, but could not pronounce it properly on account of his heavy Swedish accent and a chronic case of ligma. All right, so that's a bit of a blatant, outright, distasteful historical 
historical fabrication, but to put the scandal shortly, Bofors was an astonishingly large and disturbing pair of these nuts. Bofors was a Swedish arms company that got a huge deal to supply India with howitzers, but it turns out that Bofors was actually a parody, more specifically, a pair of these nuts. Good God, I can't stop. It turns out Bofors had actually bribed Indian politicians in order to secure the deal, and then Olaf had a meeting with some Iraqi ambassador who told him all this, and that somehow kicked off a chain of events that led to him getting shot by both of these nuts? It's not entirely clear who it's implying shot him. Uh, it's sure as Mother Mary's virgin asshole isn't implying that the CIA did it, so really it's none of our concern. But the theory is that somebody involved with the Beaufort's arm dealing or bribery situation had a plan to silence him that, well, it worked. I mean, the guy can't exactly talk much under six feet of dirt, now can he? The police, his party, or himself? Another theory is that the assassination was the result of a conspiracy among Swedish right-wing extremist police officers and the Swedish military because they saw Palme as a communist, familiar, and therefore, clearly, a major threat to national security, common decency, and heterosexuality as we know it. Another theory is that Palme's own party, the Social Democrats of Sweden, had decided that he, in fact, sucked and deserved to die and had hired a hitman to whack the guy. Bart. And the third theory, and my personal favorite along this train of thought, is that the whole thing was an elaborate staged plot for Olaf to take his own life. Yes, that was an actual theory that was put forward. Although, in a way, him doing the whole no bodyguard thing all the time yeah, bro, uh, you're gonna die eventually. Those guys are there to guard your body. They serve a function. The PKK. The PKK, or Kurdistan Workers' Party, is a militant Kurdish political organization and armed guerrilla movement. And, as we all know very well, Kurds just hate Sweden. They're like cats and dogs, they are. Oil and water. A college-aged male and a well-prepared meal. They just do not go together. I'm just kidding. To my knowledge, there is no Kurd v. Swede beef going on, but... Uh, to be fair, I don't really keep up on my Kurdistan-Swedish relationship news, so... I am so goddamn thorough with my research on this channel. I, I deserve an award, honestly. People keep saying the CIA are gonna give me the highest award in journalism. When's it happening, man? I cleared out space on my wall and everything. There appears to be a red dot on my forehead here. How strange. In 1971, Olaf made a comment saying that he blamed the fear of the masses on, quote, anarchists and people with long hair and people with beards. And for some reason that I do not clearly understand and I could find no good explanation for, this led the Stockholm Police Commissioner Hans Holmer to round up and arrest a whole bunch of Kurds living in Sweden. Really, I don't know if Kurds are notoriously hairy or anarchic, but that's just what went down, okay? So the thought behind the conspiracy is that since the Stockholm Police Commissioner did arrest a whole bunch of Kurds in connection to the Palme assassination, technically, that the PKK, a militant Kurdish political organization, might be a logical suspect for his murder. Now, surprisingly, this lead of one comment about hairy people made nearly 15 years before Olaf was shot went absolutely nowhere and led to the commissioner that rounded up all those Kurds getting kicked off the case. However, there's more. The plot thickens, okay? The, 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 there's more dirt. There's more dirt here for Toby Maguire to gently place on your retinas. I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. Fifteen years later, in 2001, a team of Swedish cops went to go interview the leader of the PKK, Abdullah Akhilan, in Turkish prison, because during his trial, he had alleged that, quote, Maybe a team of dissident Kurdish militants, led by his ex-wife, of course, not kidding, his words not mine, had murdered Palme. Which, to me, sounds like he's just trying to get revenge on the lady who took his kids and half of his... What, uh, what do Kurds use? His dinar. She took half his dinar. Hungry lady, I guess. They're always picking off your plate, aren't they? Women be shopping. And this Swedish police visit to Turkey, quote, proved to be unsuccessful. Shocker. And why am I bringing up all of these harebrained nonsense theories just to dismiss them immediately, you ask? Well, for one, I'm just kind of getting them out of the way before we get into the juicy stuff here. And two, it's my show, goddammit. And frankly, I'm having fun over here, which is something I don't get to do often after the wife slash kid slash therapist dad bang Aruba run. So just, just cut me some goddamn slack over here. The 33 year old. So because the Swedish media are by law forbidden from saying the name of a suspect in a case before they are tried, they came up with some pretty 
weird ass monikers for their prime suspects in this case. Uh, they seem to typically just pick some random ass feature about them and then just slap man at the end. It's pretty nifty. And in the case of this guy, they referred to him simply as, quote, the 33 year old which I can only hope sounds slightly less asinine in Swedish. I, however, am not the Swedish media last time I checked, so f the man and your meatballs. His name was Victor Gunnarsson, so I'm just gonna call him Victor because, again, I'm not an overworked Swedish reporter in the late 80s with a tight deadline and a crippling speedball addiction who's so late on his alimony he'll settle for just calling him the 33-year-old. I'm just an overworked American YouTuber in the early 20s with a tight deadline and a crippling speedball addiction who's so behind on his alimony that he'll resort to doing bits like this. So good old Vic Vic over here was arrested as a suspect shortly after the murder, but was soon released due to a dispute between the police and prosecuting attorneys, presumably over whose wife makes the best meatballs or gave the DA the best headline last night. It was Agnes. Does Sweden even have DAs? Is that an appropriate joke to make here? I don't even know what the f DAs do here in the States, but I'm really just filling time till I can meet my guy for the next speedball, so let's just move on here. So Vicky Boy had connections to numerous European extremist groups, and the police found pamphlets from these groups that were hostile to Palme inside of Victor's house. What makes this particular 33-year-old suspect so interesting, though, is not really the circumstances of his life but of his death. You see, in 1992, eight years after Paul May's death, the Vic Meister was found dead nearly four and a half thousand miles away in the Blue Ridge Mountains of the United States, stripped naked and with two 22 caliber pistol rounds in the back of the head. So, uh, what's up uh, with that? going on there, you ask? Well, eventually, a former police officer by the name of Lamont C. Underwood was convicted of the Vic Man's murder as part of an allegedly steamy love triangle. So, do I think that some shadowy government agency hired the Victornator here to carry out the Palme assassination, then whacked him eight years later to cover up their tracks like some conspiracy theories about this suspect suggest? Well, no. No, I don't, but I do think he porked that pig's wife. G.H. So this suspect, known to the public only as G.H., was of prime interest during the early investigation into the Palme case, based pretty much entirely on circumstantial evidence and the fact that the guy allegedly just really seemed like the type of fellow to assassinate a man. The main area of suspicion with G.H. revolved around, well, his revolver, a Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum, the gun license he had for which having once been revoked after he fired a bullet into his television, which some have claimed was his response to seeing Olaf on screen. That is some real taxi driver shit right there, but I digress. GH's Magnum was the same make, model, and caliber of gun the police determined was used by Paul May's assassin, and because he refused to turn it over to the police, it ended up being literally the only registered 357 caliber weapon in the Stockholm region not to be tested for this case. Kind of sus, just saying. GH later said that he sold the gun to an unnamed buyer in... in... Uh, f***ing Swedish, dude. Jesus Christ. Kung Strad Garden. Kung Strad Garden. Okay, that, was, that wasn't that hard, actually. I'm sure I did not pronounce it right, though. All those f***ing dots and circles over the letters are so intimidating, you know? Please let me know if I got it right in the comments, my beautiful Swedish brethren. I bet you guys are super f***ing into this part, huh? I am that I'm totally not butchering your history or anything, right? Anyway, that's about it for this guy. Seems like he had some pretty serious mental onos in the crazy department, and he had the only registered gun in the same caliber that killed Paul May to never be tested. So, the Yugoslavian connection. So, there's this German magazine called Focus, which I was like, okay, you know, it's probably the English translation since it's in German. Let me see what the actual name is. But then I looked up some pictures, and no, it's just Focus normal focus. So I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe it's the same word in both languages. English is a Germanic language after all. And it is kind of, but in German, it's spelled with a K, focus with a K instead of focus with a C. So I just found it kind of interesting that their version of switching a letter that makes the same noise, but isn't actually how you spell the word like every single Silicon Valley startup does is literally just turning it into our English spelling of focus. Yeah, that's a bit quirky in it. Uh, I really got to focus here. Anyway, in 2011, an article in Focus claimed that the Palme assassination had been carried out by a member of the Yugoslavian Security Service. That is all. The Laser Man. I find this one to be the most likely suspect, personally. Everything just lines up 
perfectly here. John Ausonius, aka John Stannerman, dubbed by the media as, quote, the laser man, was initially hauled in as a suspect in the case, but was later released when he presented an alibi, which was only the fact that he was literally provably in jail when the assassination took place. He did it. Guilty. Hang him. I don't need to see anything else. It is so obvious. Christer Peterson. Okay, so that was a bit before, obviously. I'm not particularly convinced that a man who was on record incarcerated during the moment of the assassination still somehow did it. Well, unless, of course, the media dubbed him the Laser Man because he can literally shoot lasers from his eyes capable of melting his way out of jail. But even if that was the case, uh, why would he then you know, shoot him uh, with a gun? instead of just using his Swedish laser eyes. It just, it just doesn't add up. I don't even know uh, why he was a suspect, really, uh, but he was clearly sus enough to get his own nickname in the Swedish media and a pretty dope-ass one at that, so who knows. I actually don't buy literally any of the previously mentioned suspects, to tell you the truth, but this guy, this Chris, uh, this Chris Peterson character, no tricks, no fooling, uh, he is the most likely candidate in my opinion. Well. We still haven't gotten to the CIA angle yet, but I'm saving that for the end, okay? My honey buns, you can't eat dessert before breakfast now, can you? Hey, steak and eggs? <laughs> More like cake and eggs, am I right? <laughs> My neighbors f***ing hate me. So, Christer Peterson, an alcoholic drug doer and known criminal who had actually stabbed a man to death in 1970, literally around the corner of the block from where Palme would end up being assassinated, was arrested in 1988 for the murder of Palme, which was three years after the shooting. Or wait, no, wait. It was he actually the chief prosecutor in charge of the entire investigation? Well, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, both. It's not actually the same guy. That would be... That would be insane. The chief prosecutor in the investigation is... Is a... Is a... Alcoholic drug doer and known man stabber. You know, that'd be a little kooky. But they did have the same name. The, uh... The chief prosecutor and prime suspect in the same case had the same name. How zany can he get? Well, it wasn't technically exactly the same. I mean, they sound exactly the same, but just like that whack-ass German magazine, one is with a C and one is with a K. I guess Christler Petersen is just the John Smith of Sweden, apparently. They're just throwing their names on the babies like Oprah with book recommendations. You get a Christler Petersen as a name. You you get a Christler Petersen. Just had to throw that tidbit out there for extra confusion. So before Chris's arrest, Olaf's wife, Elizabeth Palme, who had been with him when he was shot and had actually been non-fatally shot herself, picked Chris out in a police lineup as the killer. And as you can see from Chris's mugshot here, he has quite the, um, the uh, distinctive set of features. <laughs> I mean, this is not a face you're gonna forget easily after it appears in your constant nightmares. Seriously, there's no editing or anything on this photograph. The dude just looks like that. For those just listening, he kind of looks like if you took a far less attractive Jason Bateman, put one of those YouTube poop swirl effects on him, and then smacked him in the face full force with a frying pan. <laughs> the guy looks wonky. All right, his face kind of gives me a headache if I look at it for too long. This optical migraine you call a face. After being arrested, Chris was then tried and was actually found guilty and formally convicted for the assassination of Olaf Palme. So, there you go. Case closed. Mystery solved. We did it, gang. Good work. I think we've all earned a Scooby snack and some Perk 30s. Except, as with everything in this goddamn iceberg lately, it's not that simple. You see, just a few months after he was found guilty, the Swedish government threw down an UNO reverse card on Chris's conviction, determining him innocent, setting him free on appeal, and then giving him $50,000, which I'm sure he then invested very wisely and did not immediately blow on, well, blow. And the court stated several reasons for their decision to approve the acquittal, including failure to produce a clear motive for the killing, failure to produce the murder weapon, and suspicion that the police may have rigged or at least committed, quote, extremely gross errors in regards to Miss Palme picking him out in that lineup, which the court claimed involved the police giving hints to Miss Palme that Chris was an addict and, quote, allowing him to look like an alcoholic. And now, about that last one, what exactly the, in the f were they supposed to do? Give him a sponge bath and dress him up in church clothes? The dude probably looked like an alcoholic on account of the fact that 
you know, he was an alcoholic. I mean, wouldn't it be weirder if they did alter his appearance in some way? In my opinion, that sounds more like trying to sway the evidence than just letting him be the stained, unkempt, everclear smelling self that he is. Either way, the court found him guilty, then legally proclaimed whoopsie daisy and declared him innocent. Many people believe that he got off on a technicality here and is in reality guilty, and many people have tried to reopen a new trial against him. But that is pretty darn hard to do, apparently. I don't know Sweden's policy on double jeopardy and all, but I do know that every request for a new trial has been denied on the grounds that they did not provide sufficient new evidence to justify another trial. The guy even sort of confessed to it in a way, in like an OJ Simpson, if I did it kind of way. Uh, we'll get to that, but even his confession was apparently not enough new evidence for a new for a new trial. Apparently, for a new trial, there had to be something, anything put forward to the courts regarding the actual murder weapon involved in the assassination, as that was the linchpin that got Chris off during his appeal case. Which, you know, I can kind of understand, given that every registered 357 was tested, besides that one dude who hates TVs. So, in order to prove his own guilt, Chris would have to explain how the hell he could have even shot him with a 357 in the first place. Quite the pickle there. I personally would just love if he happened to be the unnamed buyer that the uh, taxi driver-esque fellow from earlier sold his gun to in the f kindergarten. Uh, but I think that that story was just a bunch of baloney anyway, honestly. I think that GH just wanted to keep his gun, so he lied, saying that he sold it so he wouldn't have to give it up to the police. That guy seemed like he wasn't really firing on all cylinders in the not being insane department, if you catch my drift. The only thing he was firing was a bullet into his own television. Now, about that confession. After swiftly burning his 50 grand in a bonfire filled with booze and hookers, Chris needed a new way to acquire more booze and hookers. So he took to doing TV and newspaper appearances regarding his role in the assassination and investigation. Several of these interviews kind of encouraged him to straight up admit to doing it, uh, which he then kind of straight up did. Uh, but obviously that is very suspect given that there was some monetary incentive involved there. Chris isn't exactly firing on all cylinders and the not accepting money for confessing to a murder so he can buy booze and hookers department. The only thing he was firing was a fat load into all the... <laughs> You, hopefully you can put that together. However, there is yet another angle to this case, and that's Chris's... Uh, well, the articles refer to them as his associates, but I think that that's a rather formal way of referring to the fellow criminals and drug addicts he engaged in crimes and druggery with. I'd prefer something along the lines of goons or droogs goobers even, but sure, yeah, let's go with associates. Several of Chris's associates all claimed that he had confessed to them personally, all with the same very specific story. And yes, I know, criminals and drug addicts are always infallible, very reliable sources of completely factual and unbiased information. I mean, look at me. My information I'm giving you is necessary, and I'm the most, I'm, 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 I'm a degenerate. But just hear me out on this, okay? These associates of his all did claim that Chris confessed to them that he, in fact, killed Paul May. But under a very strange set of circumstances, apparently the whole thing was a case of Blue on my hands. It was a case of mistaken identity. You see, Chris had allegedly been there that night with the intent to kill one Sigvard Sidergren, a drug dealer who apparently just can't stop. The dealer apparently regularly walked down this same street at that exact time and reportedly looked and dressed just like our old pal Olaf. Pretty unlucky draw there to murder the wrong guy and that wrong guy just so happens to be the prime minister of the entire damn country. But hey, I mean, it was a mistake that ended up just netting him 50 G's of coke and whore money. So really it was a wise financial decision at the end of the day. So because by Swedish law, you cannot retry someone for the same crime without major new evidence, which never came up, they weren't able to pin the assassination on this guy, but eventually, they had to pin it on someone, and for that, they chose the Scandia Man. On June 10th, 2020, the Swedish Prosecution Authority declared that Stig Engström, known by the Swedish media as the Scandia Man, was officially, in their eyes, the killer of Olaf Palme, and they formally closed the investigation. They also directly noted the lack of evidence for this conclusion, and the fact that Engström had been dead for 20 years at that point, and thus cannot be tried or prosecuted for the murder, because 
Well, it's a lot of work to dig a guy out of the ground and put him in a suit, and frankly, they're not being paid enough for that. I personally think that this whole thing was kind of a cop-out. You know, they wanted to close the case and officially pin the crime on someone, and they just legally could not do that to Chris because of the appeal and whatnot, so they chose the Scandia Man guy because... Well, it's not like he's gonna deny it or anything. He's too busy being deceased and whatnot. But besides all that, why did they say that this guy did it? Well, Angstrom was dubbed the Scandia Man after the Scandia insurance company that he worked for, as he had left that office after work shortly before the crime was committed. The claims for Angstrom's guilt largely come from investigative journalist Thomas Peterson's work in 2018. And prior to that, Angstrom had mostly been treated as a witness, given that he said, he was a witness and such. Specifically, the first witness on the scene, by his own account. Although, unless he has his eyes closed or something, the murderer is technically always the first witness to a crime, so he may have actually been right about that. The issue with this claim is that none of the other witnesses reported seeing Engstrom at the crime scene, and Engstrom also could not identify any of the other witnesses confirmed to be there either, despite claiming to have been the first witness on the scene, personally spoken to Miss Palme and the police, and even to have personally attempted to resuscitate Olaf himself. And all that is a bit sus. Absolutely. A bit of a sussy boy maneuver there, dog. I mean, why you lying? Boy, what are you hiding there, boy? What's going on here, Scandia Man Boy? There's also some loose circumstantial evidence involving a theory that the actual 357 murder weapon was owned by a friend of Angstrom's who was an avid gun collector, and some other witnesses reporting that they saw the actual assassin and that he closely resembled Angstrom's description, but I mean, come on, look at the guy. That could be any number of people. George Costanza, the Stay Puff guy, your mom. It could be anyone, really. Engstrom explained those claims away by saying that those witnesses actually mistook him running to the police after Olaf was shot to be the actual assassin. Even though he, like, probably wasn't even there for that part anyway, because none of the witnesses can identify. I, I, I do see why the whole thing is a bit sus, but even the Swedish courts were like, bro, this case is weaker than Mitch McConnell after a blood drop, but, you know, still said f it, we ball, and said he was guilty anyway. It's a complex situation. Wow, I haven't talked about the CIA at all for probably like 10 minutes. What has the series become? Okay, the CIA did it, according to this iceberg. Here we go. F these guys. It's CIA time. Robert Thiem, P2, and the CIA. In 2008, the Swedish journalist Anders Leopold, in his unpronounceable Swedish book that translates to The Swedish Tree Must Be Brought Down, he makes the case that a Chilean fascist by the name of Roberto Thieme actually killed Olaf. Leopold claims the motive was that Paul May had given asylum to a shit ton of Chilean leftists after the Chilean coup of 1973, which Roberto, being a fascist and all, would not be particularly fond of, so much so that he would decide to hit Olaf with the old one-two bullet in the back. To once again thicken this plot up a bit, Roberto was the head of a far-right political organization in Chile, which, of course, was financed by the CIA. I mean, it's a far-right group in South America, come on, they be doing that. And the CIA? Also not particularly fond of people that are giving asylum to leftists that they're paying South American death squad leaders like Blowtorch Bob good money to be annihilating. Come to think of it, Olaf actually did kind of a lot of things that the CIA were not huge fans of, such as getting up to a bit of socialist-type activities by expanding Sweden's welfare state, being an outspoken opponent of the U.S.'s war in Vietnam, and publicly showing support for Castro's communist Cuba. I mean, just look at these two. Have you ever seen a more iconic duo? I'll wait. Make them on, folks. This thing is starting to make a bit more sense here. Guy who the CIA could do without, who just so happens to go around without bodyguards, gets shiggity shot. I mean, at least you could say that they might have paid that wonky, smush-faced Jason Bateman guy to do it. Be, I see where the theory is coming from, is all. But to make this plot even thicker than your mom on leg day, who comes into the fray but propaganda do -ay? Oh, God, bars. That's right, folks. It's a crossover. I'm so overwhelmed. This is the best day! He's the national face of depression. You see, the book calling out Roberto with the name that Notch probably couldn't even pronounce, the, the one with the Swedish tree falling and whatnot, well, 
The reason it's named that is because Lucio Gelli, founder of P2, wrote in a telegram to a guy named Philip Guarino that, quote, the Swedish tree will be brought down. So what the f what the f does that mean? My personal theory is that he misdialed and was trying to hit up Paul Bunyan, but lots of other people think that it means that he wanted to whack this Olaf guy. Kinda sus though, either way. Then comes in a fellow by the name of Richard J. Brennecke, an Oregon businessman who, on Italian television in 1990, claimed that he was a former CIA agent who was involved in the Golden Triangle drug trade through Air America, among other naughty CIA no-nos. And the CIA f***ing hates this guy. They say he's a liar, a cheat, bad in bed, overall a huge doo-doo pants who won't stop causing them trouble. And that may be true. That's the end of the sentence. He's, he's probably capping pretty hardcore here, not gonna lie. That same year, 1990, Brennecke provided documents to Italian journalists. Now, whether those documents were smoking gun, irrefutable evidence of the CIA personally gunning this man down in cold blood, or just stick figures drawn in crayon on construction paper and smeared in poop and Play-Doh, we'll never really know. They were kept private and confidential, but personally, I would guess that they're closer to Kaka and Crayola than any actual evidence. And after all that, what do I think happened, you ask? Well, my personal theory is that literally all of them did it. Every single suspect, especially that laser guy that was in jail. He lasered the shit out of that snowman, I'm sure of it. Mexican dirty war. Jesus Christ, another dirty one? Uh, can somebody clean up these wars, please? We got a spill on IO Latin America over here. I just cleaned up this mess. Can we keep it clean for, for 10 <laughs> minutes? So the Mexican Dirty War, as the names being the exact same would imply, was pretty much exactly the same thing as the one in Argentina, but with a few key differences. There's a reason they're called the same thing. They were both US-sponsored brutal repressions of left-wing groups in Latin America in roughly the same time frame, both under the CIA-run Operation Condor. But the Mexican one, from my understanding, was just not as ridiculously awful. Still a horrific, terrible human rights atrocity, okay, don't get me wrong, just like, statistically, objectively not as bad from a numerical perspective, okay? Instead of the up to 30,000 killed or disappeared in Argentina, the Mexican Dirty War is estimated to be responsible for about 1,200. As far as what happened to them after they were disappeared, Seems to be same story, different continent on that one. Death flights, firing squads, prison camps, and torture. Your standard everyday stuff. Some other key differences besides the body count. It seems to me that the guerrillas in this case were a bit more legit than in Argentina comparative to the military. If Argentina was Mike Tyson against that crippled sea otter, this was more like Conor McGregor against a uh, half-drunk Andy Dick. You know, still a clear and obvious KO, but maybe Andy could throw a couple of limp-wristed slaps in there before he got straight up paralyzed by that angry little leprechaun. Whoa, this must be how baby kangaroos feel when they're on heroin. And two, in addition to the guerrillas, the Mexican Dirty War also focused heavily on the Mexican student movement of the late 60s, a broad coalition of pissed-off college students who protested against the Mexican regime's authoritarianism and political repression. The movement was also pretty pissed off about Mexico's lavish spending on the 1968 Olympic Games, the first Olympics to be held there or in any developing country for that matter. The way the students saw it, it just didn't make much sense to be dumping truckloads of pesos into building a stadium for some steroid chomping fast boys and disc throwers when the government and country were, you know, Mexico. I mean, no offense or anything, Mexico, but I mean, you can't even drink your own water without shitting until you die, dude. That may be an indication that there are more worthwhile things to go into international debt for than the Olympic Games. I am not even exaggerating about that, by the way. In most of Mexico, if you drink the water, there is a very good chance that you will get the worst diarrhea of your life, and that it may also be the last diarrhea of your life because you will literally shit out more water than you are capable of putting in your body and then die of dehydration. It's happened many times. I'm not making this shit up. Go, go try it out for yourself, okay? I'll pour up a glass right now, fuck boy. Don't play with me. The student slogan was, no quiermos olimpiadas, quiermos revolucion, which translated to burger slash crumpet speak means we do not want Olympic games. We want a revolution. The Olympic committee then noticed all of this hullabaloo and threatened to move the games to Los Angeles if all this didn't get sorted out and fast. The Mexican government then went about achieving this by open 
firing into a crowd of student protesters, killing up to 400 unarmed civilians in an event known as the Teletacomo Massacre. Three years later, in a non-Olympic Games related protest, Mexico thought to itself, wait, 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 wait run that back, and committed the Corpus Christi Massacre, which killed 121. So the lesson here, kids, is just don't live in Mexico. Okay, move somewhere where the tap water isn't going to turn your anus into Niagara Falls. The, the cane sugar cokes are just not worth it. So, fellas, I'm working on a podcast right now. By the time this video goes up, there should be some episodes out on my second channel. Uh, the channel's called Necessary Nonsense. Uh, you can find it on my channel's page. Go over there, subscribe, check out the podcast, show some support for your boy. If you, just, if you, if you need more of me and there's not enough content because I make like one of these a month. Also, you can be on the podcast if you go to my Patreon in the description. There's a podcast here. You you can join on there and we can we, we can have a chat. Oh, also guys, I don't know if you've ever heard of a little channel called Mr. Beat. No, Mr. Beast, Mr. Mr. Beat. Well, I love the guy and a while back I saw that he subscribed, hit him up and well, we ended up doing a collab together. So go check that out. It's about the JFK assassination. He was so kind enough to let me come on there and spit some CIA conspiracy stuff for a while. He's just a, just a swell dude. If it's out now, I'll link it in the description. If not, it'll be out soon. And uh, in the meantime, head over to his channel and subscribe. He's a great guy, makes great content, and I, I just really appreciate the opportunity. So thank, thanks, thanks, Mr. Beat, if you're watching. Thanks. Thank you, bro. It's also just a really good video. Some of his best work, for sure. I got a little sneak preview and... Uh, Good stuff. Good stuff, man. Please support me on Patreon if you can. I'm about to move to a different state and uh, trying to make a lot more YouTube videos, but I'm going to be making a lot less money too, so uh, uh, your boy needs to eat. If you like the video, like the video. Do it. Do it now. And here's a shout out to my god tier patrons. Cameron J, Operator Metro, I Tuck Between, Chase B, DeAndre M, Nadian Syrup, Shalom L, Arya and Calcifer, Just a Koala, Rena J, and Maxman Beta. And to my extra special 20 buckaroos who give me 20 bucks a month. That's crazy. Fuzzy Viper Shark, Joey L, Chloe B, Al the Pat, Adam K, Vladimir S, Harabudica, and Rare Bees. Working on part seven now. It's going to be coming out soon, but go watch some of my other videos, damn it. I, I just put out a video about ancient Rome, and it is it is not getting love. Do, do you people only like me for my, my CIA information? I'm going to cry. Anyway, that's it. I love you all. Thanks for watching. Go ahead and click this video now. What are you, just going to just gonna listen to the voices in your head? No, you need something to drown it out. Click it. Click it and watch it. Do it. Please. Please.